Over 120 years ago, four lines were written by a British operetta lyricist. Four lines still sung today. Four lines, 23 words held in such reverence that the song is known as the song, the theme song, the anthem of the Blue Hill Troop. But can any among us recite the words? Hail poetry. No, I can't. <laughs> Hail poetry, thou heavenly, no I can't, nobody can, unless you're in a group of lots of people and then it just happens. Hail poetry, thou heaven born maid, and then I get lost. Thou gildest in the pirate's trade. <laughs> I can't remember the rest now. Uh, you know, all flowing forms of sentiment. Um, all hail, all hail. Divine. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> I have the foggiest idea. Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> Molly, it's a soap solution, something like that. Divine emollient. This wonderful, soothing balm. I think it means that I'm like hand lotion. All hail, all hail, divine hand lotion. <laughs> uh, poetry soothes savage beasts. It's just, you can't sing it without getting just a little misty. It's wonderful. <laughs> Every time we sing it, my heart swells and I get a lump in my throat. And just hearing all of those voices and knowing all of the caring people that are singing that song. It's just a feeling of pride and I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to know the words and I'm happy to be one of the singers in the song. For 75 years, the members of the Blue Hill Troop have been the singers of the song. In 1924, they created the troupe. Uh, they created the troupe to keep the kids out of trouble in the summer. Then they found out that they liked singing together. Then because they liked singing together, they had to sing for somebody. And I guess that's about the way it put together. In the summer of 1924, by that time I was getting quite old. I was almost learning to drive a car. Uh, and they decided the children were maybe having too much fun. That's my idea. And uh, so we better put on pinafore. And they ruined our summer completely. That summer, Elida Milliken had unwittingly become a forebear to all the singers of the song who were to follow. A tradition had been born. I remember walking out the front door of our living room, across the front porch, as I heard some of those grown-ups that had been fluttering up our house all these weeks say, my, that was fun. Let's get together in New York and do it again. <laughs> and again, and again, and again they did. Singers traversed the stage. Sets were constructed and torn down. Hours and hours of undocumented toil by our troop ancestors. They peer from sepia tone photographs. Faces of old New York. Faces from the society pages. Faces of white gloved ladies. Their voices now either silent or fading. Our troop ancestors have passed the song on to those who sing with us still. It was really an overwhelming experience to be on stage with those people like Cope Walbridge and Conrad Hooper and a number of others. And with each new generation, the troop evolves and grows. By the 50s, the group had again caught the eye of one of our very first chorus girls. I was playing bridge with Lois and Jay and Bill Green. And Sundays, they were no damn good because they were all Blue Hill Trooping. And I was left by myself. So you decided to join? So rejoin. finally, I thought, well, gee, why don't I go with them? So I thought, I can, I can hammer nails as well as the rest of them. 
but not at all. I had to go through an admissions committee. <laughs> and I was furious at having to go through an admissions committee. I'd given birth to the damn thing. <laughs> The tradition that began innocently in Blue Hill, Maine, has become our calling card and battle cry that we shall present the Gilbert and Sullivan Canon. GNS is extremely flexible. It would have to be. It can be, it can be played by people in kindergarten, people in retirement homes, and, and everything in between. It's just a remarkable body of work that can be pulled and tugged in a thousand different ways. Each time we, I come back to a show, it's a completely different show. You've got a different director, different leads, and it's different, which is kind of fun. You get a chance to try out different ways for different things, but you know that sooner or later you're going to come around to the one you like the best. I have done the same role two or in the case of sorcerer three times I was I there's a wonderful I challenge of trying to do it better trying to build on what you did before uh, you also have the advantage of maybe growing into the role age-wise that finally it's maybe more age appropriate which is certainly true too. recent years have brought a new tradition the fall show really requires a lot of concentrated energy because you're, you're, you've got such a, a smaller frame of time to do it in. So you have to bring a lot of concentration and a lot of time all at once to it. And it, it's very gratifying, but it's exhausting. The fall show has proved to be an exciting showcase for talented troopers many of whom relish the opportunity to present traditional musical theater and to work in genres other than GNS. But it is the Gilbert and Sullivan tradition, begun by the Millicans 75 years ago, that remains the primary endeavor of BHP. GNS is our destiny, and there's no escaping. If our troop ancestors could see us, what would they think of all they have wrought? Well, I think they would be absolutely, totally delighted. When troop friends work together, miracles can happen. We enjoy each other's comp company, but the fact that we produce something makes a lot of difference. As rehearsals begin, lines are memorized, notes are learned. And the chorus stumbles through its choreographed patterns. Where once there was chaos, a show begins to take shape. I'm always sorry when rehearsals end. I just, I just enjoy the process so much. It could go on forever as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> While the front stage rehearses, in another part of town, the backstagers are hard at work. Well, when we first got in the troupe, there were only about five people in the backstage and it was all, all the emphasis was on the front stage. Now I think it's the other way around almost. Costumes are formed from flat cloth. Props appear from piles of scraps and odds and ends. Walls and platforms appear where there were none. And while the final product is important, what really matters is the adventure of getting there. I really enjoy the process. I enjoy it starting with pieces of wood and uh, a group of people and, and seeing it all put together and eventually making its way uh, on the stage and into the theater. And I really find that very exciting, very pleasant. The workspace sessions are exhausting. Just when the backstagers think they'll never be able to move another muscle, the move to the theater presents yet another set of challenges. We'd loaded the flatbed uh, with a whole tier of flats, one on top of the other. 
And to speed things along, we didn't tie them down very well. And we were bouncing up 10th Avenue toward Hunter College. We got about opposite where the uh, uh, current Jacob Javits Convention Center is, but in those days, it wasn't there. And a huge gust of wind came across uh, that open space and hit the flats on the back of the truck and literally blew three or four of them off the truck. And if you can imagine Castle Adamant bouncing down uh, 10th Avenue into the oncoming mass of the block traffic moving forward with the next series of lights. Cars going to the left, cars going to the right, the portcullis bouncing around in the middle of two or three cabs. And once we're there, the chaos begins. I remember building sets at First Avenue uh, and 23rd Street, and then moving up to the theater. And there were all these other people. Of course, they were the front stages. And there was a show going on, but I seem to have forgotten totally of what all of that was. And the front stagers are in awe of what the backstagers have created. I love this set. It's excellent. I love it. It's beautiful. I want to see that house. I want to live in that house. One of the most satisfying experiences was working on Utopia in 1994. It was the first set that I designed for the troupe. It came out exactly the way I had imagined it. I, it was done in sort of Art Deco style with doors that were actually lifted from or in great part inspired by uh, the Chrysler building. And it was just so exciting to see it come to life. When we, we moved into the theater and all of a sudden um, it, it, this puzzle came together, it was just magic. And I suddenly realized that part of that wall I had built, it was just an incredible feeling. As the backstagers are busy putting the final touches on their creations, The director and stage manager are working hard to pull it all together. Susan wants me to do something with the giving her the timing of the hand thing and turning it downstairs. I don't think the stage. Okay. The behind the scenes troopers are filling the seats and producing the program. And the front stagers are becoming acclimated to their new surroundings. It's my parasol. Ask any questions about where they are supposed to be at this point. One of the funniest things is to watch a new male trooper put tights on over his socks and box, boxer shorts. And you think to yourself, does this person really know <laughs> that tights don't go over one's socks and boxer shorts? It can be very difficult to explain to um, female chorus members that they're actually not dressing in clothes that they're going to go out in that this is in fact a costume and has to look a certain way. Men will pretty much put on whatever you hand them and wear it just as you hand it to them. Whereas women try and, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, the dress is a little bit long or the dress is a little bit too short for me. And they're sort of going, well, that's the period and that's a costume. It's not, you're not going to work in it, so relax. As the opening night deadline looms, tension builds, and sometimes tempers flare. There are highs and there are lows. There are always uh, the negative side. There's always that one day in the theater where everybody seems to be absolutely nuts, stressed, angry, something. And then the next day, it's like nothing happened at all. For several weeks, no one has had much sleep. And as last minute touches are made, and the cast prepares to go on stage, five minutes, ladies and gentlemen, five minutes. nerves begin to mount. I had been out of theater for a few years, and, you know, I, I kind of thought, well, this will be second nature. I got just as nervous and excited as if I had been opening down the road on Broadway. When the show is up and running, things usually go quite smoothly. But sometimes, a singer is handed a surprise during a performance. I was playing the captain in our 1974 production of Pinafore. I am the captain of the Pinafore. And Susan Prince was playing Buttercup. We were staged to have a big kiss just before uh, the captain has his last solo line. And as I kissed Susan, I suddenly found that I had an oyster 
in my mouth that she had put from pushed forward from her mouth and I my whole life went flash before my eyes trying to figure out how to get rid of it and then I just held her uh, close to me and shot it right back uh, and then went on to sing the line that immediately followed. The biggest charge I got was when Buttercup fell into the orchestra pit during a performance landing on the second flute with no damage basically to either Buttercup or the second flute or the instrument itself. The frantic scurry happening in the wings is usually well hidden. And from the front of the house, all the audience can see is a beautiful production. And for all of our repeat customers, it is one spectacular production after another. You don't really get a concept of that all coming together until you actually see the show and then you, you see the actors on stage singing beautifully and the costumes match the set. And the props are, look like what they should be and you just think to yourself, wow, you know, I am so proud of, of the people that have made that happen. Every time the front stage gets a curtain call and gets applause, we feel that. When the front stage goes out there, it does an extraordinary job. Um, it's only a wonderful reflection on what we've done, and that's really exciting. Because it isn't one person, it's a group, and it doesn't happen without the group. Eventually, the show comes to a close. The physical remnants of the production are swept away. Three weeks ago, this stage looked as it looks now, cold and barren. Yet only three hours ago, it was filled with something truly magical, the music and color and lights of a Blue Hill Troop production. While show production has always been our primary endeavor, our troop ancestors also set the standard for good times. We're going to go drink heavily. <laughs> and over the years, we troopers have been sure to carry on the tradition of late night partying. Whether we're wearing wigs, or dancing into the wee hours of the morning. Wherever you find us, we are always having fun. There was uh, liquor available, martinis and so on, for both the admission committee and the people who were trying out. And uh, by the time it got to my tryout, I was the last one. Uh, I think a chimpanzee in a Brooks Brothers suit would have been brought into the troupe. And I remember being completely exhausted during the run of the show because every night we would go out and have a wonderful time and party until 4 a.m. And sometimes troop parties occur during the day, like the tradition of the troop picnic, which has always been a popular event. The Shefflins started it all. Yes, we had the first troop picnic when, when we lived in Bedford. And uh, that sort of started the picnics. Must have been about 1932. No to the Mary Crest, no the eggs and the ham. No the mustard crest, no the strawberry jam. And the picnics have continued from the shores of Long Island and Southport to the bastions of Westport. More recently, the picnic has been combined with the annual props auction. Four dollars for Don Woodman. <laughs> no, wait, wait a second. Four dollars for Don Wood Woodman, comma, the former pirate king. <laughs> but you won't always find troopers in their jeans and khakis. The winter dance gives everyone a chance to clean up and turn out in their finest.
And at the end of the evening, there's always the tradition of singing a song from the current year's show. Some of our most treasured troop traditions occur on the last day of performances. The backstage brunch kicks off what we call the longest day of the year on Saturday, which is our two-show day that encloses the, the run. Um, it's a great roast and toast where we acknowledge people that have you know, uh, made contributions above and beyond. F. Puppets University. <laughs> <laughs> On this last day of the show, we celebrate all that we've accomplished, and we also poke fun at ourselves. Be he nerd or be he jock, he must have a rising <laughs> I think that the tradition of having a between-the-shows party on the last day of, of the run is a wonderful thing that allows, really allows, not for the first time, but sort of consolidates the, the or uh, solidifies, rather, the um, relationship between backstage and front stage, which has been growing over the week that we're together. Sometimes traditions are struck. For the first 50 years of the Blue Hill Troop, the presidents were all men. But in the 51st year, I became the first woman president. I think I must have done things OK, because since then, there have been a number of women presidents. And um, I was very nervous about starting this, but it was fun. The traditions change over the years, but wherever and whenever troopers gather, a party is bound to follow. One wonders what our troop ancestors might think of our current traditions. What would the doctor think looking down on it? Well, I know one thing he'd think. Well, they still enjoy a good party. <laughs> I know that uh, from time to time people are asked just what, 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 is, the, what is the one word that, that might, might describe the, the, the troop. And the only one I can think of to answer that is, is, is the word troop. Community. Incredible. Insane. <laughs> no, no, there's Tradition. Unique. Spectacular. Miraculous. Fun, fun, fun. Totally awesome. Commitment. Committed. And I like to think of that as sort of a, they could be committed or they are committed. Uh, it's kind of hard to put one weird word. Of course, weird is a very good word for the whole operation anyway. Weird or wonderful, or a little of both, there's something about the troop that has kept it going strong for 75 years. For many, BHT is a family affair evidenced by the many married couples who first met during troop activities. From these marriages spring troop children who often get into the act at parties, picnics. I have a song to sing. Sing me your song. Rehearsals. Performances. And, as the kids get a little older, some of them even make it on stage. Often troop kids grow up to become troop members in their own right. 
What is it that keeps us coming back each year? I keep coming back to the troop year after year because I have uh, partial amnesia and I forget how tired I am <laughs> at the end of every season and, and I miss everybody. It's just, it's this way of getting out of the everyday tension of life and having a good time with your best friends. Part of the intensity and the, and the importance of that friendship is that you are working together and you have to rely on one another, you have to trust one another. Um, everybody has to do their part, and they do, year after year. Every year when I complete a show, I think, you know what, I'm going to take a break next season, and then my friends are involved in it and they're, they're either ahead of a committee or they, they need some help and um, I just can't think of not being there. Sing high, sing low, wherever they go. Sing high, sing low, wherever they go. Wherever they go, wherever they go, they all shall equal be. And uh, I think that's something we strive to do in the troupe. Um, we try to make everybody feel like their contribution is really important. To the outside world, the Blue Hill Troop offers physical evidence of its place in the greater community. Each year there has existed for a time a set, costumes, props, and singers on a stage in a theatrical production of grand style. Very real dollars have been raised and donated to worthwhile charities. And yet, within our ranks, we know that the troop does not exist in the physical world. The essence of the troop exists in the hearts of its members, in the love that we share, in the fun that spontaneously erupts whenever we come together. We are the troop. Once you identify it as your, your family, in a sense, or your small community within a larger community, it doesn't matter why you come back. It doesn't even matter uh, that you don't come back every single year, perhaps. Um, but what matters is that it's there. And when you do come back, uh, you meet the same kinds of wonderful friendships that, that you've had all along. It's, it's, a, it's a life time of, uh, of, of joy and and wonder and delight. And I think it's more than that than, than laughter. There's been tons of laughs. It's probably been tons of cries. But that's the theater. That's life. The voices of the past are stilled, but their legacy sings on. Today's troopers have picked up their melody and sing with full voice, backstagers and frontstagers alike. The song we sing blends the music of sewing machines, band saws, and electric screwdrivers with the thrilling harmonies of those who know the notes. Each year, new members add their voices and the melody soars, a celebration of laughter, art, charity, and friendship. Most of all, we sing of friendship. And so the song continues. <laughs>